For those of you who don't know, my name is Dexter Upshaw. They call me Pastor Dex. And I have the privilege, the honor, and the responsibility of serving as the senior pastor here at New Vision. You've already been sufficiently welcome. And um, I'm grateful to be with you here today. Um, I'm on assignment today. Sometimes the water gets hot, scalding hot. You got to let some cold water flow in so it's the right temperature. And so I don't want to rain on anybody's parade today. I'm just on assignment um, to bring us where we need to go. So if you hear a sobriety and a weight in my voice, it's because we have um, some great things that God wants to do through us. Uh, but great things require great responsibility. And this is one of those seasons where to whom much is given, much is required. Family, you've been given much. And God is saying this is a season where I require of you. And when you start realizing what God requires of you, sometimes you get still because you realize this is not a game. This is serious business. Somebody say serious business. For those of you here for the first, second, or third time, congratulations. You came the day before a fast and a consecration. Because starting tomorrow, we will begin our summer fast. We're going to consecrate for seven days. And we have been under this banner of sanctified summer. We preached that last week, and now that has become the theme for the next couple of weeks. Somebody say sanctified summer. God wants to sanctify your summer before it begins. He wants to sanctify your summer before it begins. He wants to get some things in us, get some things in our mind and in our heart. He wants to deal with some patterns before we get deep into July. Because if the truth be told, many of us have patterns during the summer that are unhealthy. One amen, two amen. I think if I get three amens, I can, I can do something with three amens. How many of you agree that you've got some summer stories? And so God wants to break the cycle, and then we're in a place with, in our society, in our nation, um, the craziness is just beginning. In the midst of the craziness, we need a church who understands who they are, why they're here, and understand their assignment. And then for us as a congregation, there are some things that God wants to do through us, some things that have been spoken over the life of New Vision. And we want to get ready for what God is getting ready to do. And so there are times where the Lord will use a leader to call a fast. And that's where we are now. This fast will begin tomorrow. It will run from June 3rd to June 9th. It will start tomorrow morning. We'll begin with a 6 a.m. prayer call. Every morning for the next seven days, we will have a 6 a.m. prayer call. The prayer call is only about 30 minutes. It's led by our pastoral leadership team. You dial in. All the information is via the QR code that's on the screen. You can scan that QR code or you can go to our website, nvim.org, click Summer Fast, and you'll see all the details that you need to know. Every evening, we will have a 7 p.m. broadcast. I'll be going live, and I'll just be sharing some things that God has placed on my heart to help us collectively as we go through this fast and this season. Of course, on Tuesday night, we will still have Tuesday night worship. We'll have Transformation Tuesday. We'll still have family dinner at 6 um, and we'll have a, a hopefully a meal that's fast friendly for those of you who are doing vegetables only. But we're going to take these next seven days to really pursue God. For fasting types, some of you have never fasted before, uh, we suggest four different types of fast. Um, one, you could do liquids only. Um, you could do what we call a Daniel fast, where you just eat vegetables and fruit and you abstain from meat. You can do a once a meal, one meal a day fast, where you eat once over the course of the day, or you can do an absolute fast where you abstain from eating solid foods um, and just focus on liquids, or you abstain from solid foods, liquids, waters. Uh, whatever you do, you need to do it based on the leading of the Holy Spirit. If by chance you have some significant medical something that you need to talk with your physician about, make sure you um, utilize wisdom. But the key to fasting is to make a commitment. You can take one of these fasting types and you can go the entire seven days or based on your schedule and based on the leading of the Lord, you can combine one or two different fasting types. But the goal is to participate. My hope is that each and every one of you, if you feel like you're a part of New Vision, officially or unofficially, 
because some of y'all been stalking us, hanging out with us in the streets. You say, you know, New Vision is it, but we don't know you, but we're getting to know you. Shout out to the new members orientation. We had some 20 folks who made it official. But if you feel a connection to this house, and this is the place where you get fed spiritually, then I encourage you to lock in and to participate and to be a part at some level. All right? And once again, when you scan that QR code or go to our website, somebody say all the details. I mean, we write it out, list it out. It's up there. If you fall off, what do you do? You get back up. You fall forward. And let's march together and see what God is going to do on the other side of these seven days. Somebody say sanctified. sanctified. Summer. Summer. If you could please jump to your feet. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Verses 11 through 15. If you are able to stand for the reading of God's word, we invite you to do so. The word is also on the screen. Second Chronicles 7 and 11. Verse 11 says, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's palace and successfully completed all that he had planned on doing in the house of the Lord in his palace. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence amongst my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Verse 15, now my eyes, says the Lord, will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. This is the word of the Lord. And the church said, I want to teach today from the topic, Lord, hear our prayers. Hashtag sanctified summer. You may be seated. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our cries. Hear our requests. Open your eyes to see your people. As we get into this word, dear God, would you speak clearly concerning the goals of this time of fasting and consecration. Speak individually and speak collectively. Lord, you are dealing with the individual and you're dealing with the collective. In fact, whenever you deal with an individual, it's always for the benefit of the collective. So, Father, may this word be exactly what someone needs to hear. And may there, dear God, be a shift in this season. And may you carve out a people whom you are pleased with as we continue down this summer season. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Immediately, for some of you, you're wondering, why do we need to fast? Some of you are mad because um, you had plans this week. And so now you're dealing with the tension of pastor said, but. And I get it. I understand it. Uh, you're grown. You do what you want to do. But might I suggest to you that when you are a part of a collective, when you're part of a people, sometimes God will disrupt our regularly scheduled programming in order to get our attention and to position us for what's next. And the truth be told, if we're not careful, we will allow our flesh to get out of control. And what I found is that during the summer months, it's a very strange season for the people of God and the body of Christ, the average church, you can walk into it, throw a rock, and not hit anybody. Some folks go on vacation for three months, and they're right around the corner.
I'm serious. It's one thing to go and travel and you got tickets and you got a resort that you're going to and you come back. But some people vacation from the house of God. And, and, and they spend their Sundays in the sun and they find other things to do. And especially in New England, there's this mindset. It's a compartmentalized mindset because we do our Sunday thing and we do our seasonal thing. And God is saying, I need you to do my lifestyle thing. That this thing called Christianity is a lifestyle. It's not something you turn on and you turn off. No, it's 365 days, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, four seasons a year. God is saying, I am doing something in my people. And to be completely honest, for some of us, our worst foolishness happens during the summer. Selah. Think on that. Don't think too hard. Because some of us have some summer memories that need to be replaced with new summer memories. <laughs> some of us need to start to program our minds to incorporate the glory of God from June through July through August. That God wants to reprogram the way we think about summer that some of the temptations that got us back in 23, back in 22, back in 21, God is saying, I'm writing a new story for you. And where I'm taking you, you can't avoid to give up the territory that you've gained during this season of being submitted to the word and being submitted to worship and being amongst the people of God. God is calling out to a people and saying, who do you want to be this summer? Are you for heaven or for you? Are you for the streets? Is this a hot girl summer, hot boy summer or a sanctified summer? You choose, and guess what? You grown. But if you're big enough and bad enough to do what you do, then be big enough and bad enough to deal with the consequences. But when you start to mature spiritually, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I acted as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And God is saying to a population of people, this is your season for maturity. That's what you did, but this is what you're doing. That's how you lived, but this is how you're living. I'm establishing a new culture and strongholds of righteousness. You can have strongholds of ratchetness or you can have strongholds of righteousness. You want to be ratchet or do you want to be righteous? You want to be ratchet or you want to be righteous? There's plenty of ratchetness out there. North, south, east, west. Close your eyes, pin the tail on the donkey, and you'll find something. But God is looking for some people who want to be righteous. Which is why God would do something strange like call a fast. At the beginning of the summer, and I need you to understand what this is and what it isn't. And, and this is going to bless you individually, and I'm speaking to you individually. But I need some of you to understand that you are a part of a collective, that what you do individually either helps or hinders the movement of God's people. And, and I want some of you to begin to think as a collective See, you've been making Lone Ranger moves. You've been doing stuff on your own. You've been detaching yourself from your places of accountability. You started out with an accountability partner in January, but you ain't told your accountability partner everything that happened since quarter one. It's quiet in here. It's not just about how you start, it's about how you persist and how you finish. And God is saying, I need you to, to, to get back into cycles of righteousness. There's some who were, who were connected and, and somewhere between month one and month six, you've gotten disconnected because life happened, because someone showed up, because something rocked your world, because some money was taken out of your pocket. Don't you let those things pull you away from the presence and the power of God. God is saying, now's the time to revive your commitment to me because I'm going to tell you something about what's coming down the pike. You need God more than you need people. You need God. More than you need money in your pocket, 
You need God more than you need all the stuff that often pulls us away from his presence. I need you to know that we need God more than ever. Stuff happening in your life personally, you need him more than ever. Stuff's happening in the life of our congregation. This season that we're in has been one of much trials and tribulations. It's been one of much stress and difficulty. Every single day I'm bombarded with text messages and emails and phone calls of bad news and people going through things. There's stuff that we're fighting for that some of you will never, ever understand or realize. All for the sake of the faith and for the sake of doing what God has placed us in the earth to do. So I've learned something in seasons like this, especially when you get to your breaking point. That's where some of us are. We were hoping that the suffering would have subsided, but here we are in June, and it seems like things ain't getting better yet. Am I speaking to anybody yeah. here that, that, that there's been some things that have been going on, and you were hoping that you'd get past it by now, but here you are, and the challenges are still there, and you're at the place where you're saying, God, I don't think I can take much more. I, I don't think I can handle any more pressure. I don't think that I can handle one more message about bad news. I, I don't think I can handle it. And I'm here to let you know that this is a breaking point. The enemy wants to break you down, but God wants to break you through. Either you're going to break down or you're going to break through. Either you're going to break down or you're going to break out. And I'm here to let you know that when you posture yourself, and you submit yourself to the power of God. And when you surrender your flesh once again. And when you crucify your flesh. And when you push away your plate. And when you seek the face of the Lord. He is the one who refuels you and helps you to get through to whatever is on the other side of this. So I'm here to let you know, New Vision. This is a time of fasting and consecration. Let's first talk about the purpose of fasting. Somebody say fasting. fasting. Fasting deals with your belly. It deals with your plate. It deals with what you eat. Fasting is the discipline of abstaining from food with the purpose of hearing from God, the purpose of hearing better from God. Fasting always deals with your body. Some people say I'm fasting from a certain type of music. No, no, no. Fasting means that you stop eating something. Fasting means that you give up a meal. Fasting means that you inconvenience your meal schedule to have an appointment with the Lord. Fasting means you stop eating or you alter what you eat or you prohibit yourself from eating certain things and drinking certain things. Why? With the purpose of allowing your flesh to be put under your feet. Theologically speaking, when you read the New Testament scriptures, you understand that the flesh is the seed of sin and rebellion. So in the scriptures, the flesh represents the part of us that likes sin. The desires of the flesh in New Testament scripture is never a positive thing. So when we crucify the flesh spiritually and we step into seasons where naturally we deny our flesh, it's to give space for the spirit to speak. So God will alter our eating patterns. Can't slide into that drive through like you normally do. And when you normally would slide into the drive through slide into the cafeteria, slide into your refrigerator, you slide down to your knees, you slide down into your prayer pillow, and you begin to spend time with God. That's your meal. That's your food. Your time with God, that's your, that's your dessert too. Your time, that's your appetizer, that's your entree, that's your dessert. Some of us get excited about food. We're just excited, just excited, just excited. You can't wait for Thanksgiving. And it's June. You just had a cookout last week, you can't wait for the next one. Child, I just need my hot dog. My hot dog with my mustard on it. And you anticipate it. You have cookouts and stuff you go to, you don't even eat before. Because you want to have enough room. 
You want to have enough space. You want to track your, cal your caloric intake and make sure you've, you've been tracking your, ma your macros and you, and you held back the past couple of days because you're ready. Yeah? You want to be able to sit and to eat freely, first natural, then spiritual. When's the last time you longed for a spiritual meal? When's the last time you tried to beat somebody to the table to get into the word of God? When's the last time you fought to get to the altar? We'd open up that word more than we open up the refrigerator. In times of fasting, you open up the prayer closet more than you open up the pantry door. So fasting deals with your belly. And when you deal with your belly, you see what you're really working with. First couple of days, you see how much flesh you really got. <laughs> you, you, you see how much flesh you're really working with. As some stuff starts coming out of you, you say, Lord, I, it's just the Lord bringing it to the forefront because you need to be aware of your humanity. You need to be aware that you still got work to do. And you need to be aware that, that you still got some ugliness within you, that you still got an attitude problem that needs to be kept under your feet. The Lord begins to pull it out of you, which should push you to know that you need God more, more than you've been acting like. So fasting deals with the body. So it's a time of fasting and consecration. The purpose of consecration is the act of separating ourselves from worldly activities to give ourselves to scripture, study, and prayer. So consecration is when you turn off the radio. Consecration is when you delete Instagram on your phone because you've been scrolling your mind out. And God is saying, I don't need you in the stories of people. I need you, to, I need you in my stories. I got stories. And they don't disappear after 24 hours. I've got stories in this word that are going to help you more than stalking your friends and your family. I've got some things in this book that you're not going to find in Facebook. I've got, some, I've got some stuff that I need you to to, to reflect on, and the only way to get to a place to hear from God is to retreat from other stuff. And so now your patterns should change. The way you consume media should be altered. Certain stuff you can't watch during a season of consecration. And some of the stuff you shouldn't be watching outside of seasons of consecration, which is why you need seasons of consecration to remind you that you ain't supposed to be watching it anyway. You ain't supposed to be smoking marijuana anyway. And the fast is an opportunity to break the cycle. And perhaps during that time of sobriety, the Lord can speak to you. And as he speaks to you, you'll get a better understanding of what he's calling you to do. And he will begin to deal with the reasons why you smoke. The reasons why you drink. You ain't supposed to be having sex outside of marriage anyway. Let me preach to this. I'm going to preach to this light right here. Amen, lights. But the fast is an opportunity to say no under the anointing of the corporate gathering and purpose and commission to establish a new cycle. You weren't supposed to be looking at pornography anyway. But the fast and the consecration is an opportunity and an excuse to break the cycle. And certain habits that you break because you are fasting, you continue new cycles of righteousness because during the time of fasting and consecration, you see God and you begin to see yourself in view of what you see about God. So consecration means that there's some stuff that you used to do that you don't do during times of consecration. There's some phone calls that you normally have. You know that gossip phone call? You know, people you talk to and all y'all do is spill the tea. It's a lot of tea. Boston Tea Party, just spill tea, tea, tea. 
Too much tea. Too much tea. So don't judge the person that's dealing with marijuana. You got a problem with gossip. You start, you start scratching if, if you ain't spilt the tea, ain't talked about this and that. God is saying, I need you to learn how to pray. Stop talking about people. Pray. And on top of that, I will remove you from social media and all these talking heads and Instagram and YouTube influencers who all they want to do is gossip about other people's lives. Why don't you live your life and stop talking about other people's lives? And make sure you sweep in front of your own porch, lest you become the topic of discussion for somebody else. God is coming for all of it in this season. Consecration pulls you apart from those regular rhythms so you can examine yourself and make sure you're doing what you're supposed to do and make sure you're thinking what you're supposed to think. But whenever we pull away from something, we draw closer to him. You're pulling away to draw closer. You're pulling away to draw closer. You're fleeing unrighteousness so that you can pursue righteousness. And God is saying, why don't you pursue me? And you're saying, well, I'm at church. First off, this ain't church. This is a worship gathering. You're supposed to be the church. Let's just start there. You're coming to church and you're missing the point. You need to come to worship to meet Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit and hear the word of God so you can cooperate with the will of the Father. Oh, I'm serving in ministry. But why are you serving in ministry? What's your motivation? Where's your heart? God is coming for all of that. And he's looking for purity of heart. And so fasting and consecration will take you back down to square one. And sometimes... He brings us back to the basics so we can make sure we're doing stuff for the right reasons. Come on, can you admit that sometimes you lose your way? Sometimes you go through a rut. Sometimes you're just going through the motions. Sometimes you're just doing what you think you should do versus doing what you know you're supposed to do. So fasting and consecration is a gift because it allows us to reset. And here's the goal. Our flesh must decrease so that the spirit can increase. Say that with me. My flesh, My flesh must, decrease must decrease so that the spirit, so that the spirit can, increase. can increase. It's coming on the screens. My flesh shall decrease, flesh shall decrease. so that the spirit, so that the spirit can, increase. can increase. According to Galatians 5, we must crucify our flesh. And that's what fasting and consecration does. So let's let's deal with this. Today we're in a passage of scripture, Second Chronicles chapter 7, and we are looking at what God did for a man named Solomon, King Solomon. He was a leader of God's people at a specific time in history. And I want you to understand what was happening in Solomon's life and the people of God so we can pull out of this moment that Solomon had with the Lord and, and be able to understand what we need to do now in this fast for the summer. You see, God had told Solomon to build a temple. Solomon's father, David, actually wanted to build the temple, but David had too much blood on his hands, and so God assigned Solomon the task of building a temple. Up until that point, the people of God were always mobile. They were always moving from place to place and having to establish a tabernacle and then pack that tabernacle out and then put it somewhere else. And at this moment, God is saying, I want a permanent place and I want my glory to reside in this permanent place. So God began to speak to Solomon about the type of temple that he would build. And Solomon rallied the people and they followed instructions. And they built this magnificent house of worship. But before moving forward and before moving in, they dedicated the place to God. I need you to understand that there's something powerful about dedicating something to God. In this instance, it was a physical place of worship. And before they started utilizing it, they dedicated it. You can dedicate places to God. You can dedicate people to God, which is why we have baby dedications. You can dedicate seasons to God. And all I'm saying right now is before we get into this summer, God is saying, give me that. Before you step into the summer and do what you want to do, God is saying, bless me first. 
before Solomon and the people could go in and do what they wanted to do in the temple, God said, bless me first, dedicate it unto me. So that's where we are. Verse 1, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. Now when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven. Let's go back to verse 7. Verse 1, verse 1, 7 and 1, 7 and 1. Go back, go back, go back. Okay. Now when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering, the sacrifices, and the glory of God filled the house. Can you just imagine for a moment? You've got this wonderful edifice and the people have been working hard to put it together. And now you have the worship service to dedicate it. You have the offerings at the altar. And then Yahweh shows up. Yahweh, Yahweh, holy is your name. I won't take it in vain. Listen, let me help you understand something. If Yahweh really showed up and his glory showed up and his fire showed up, you. <laughs> fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of God filled the house. And verse 2 says the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the house. The glory was so heavy that the priest had to stand on the outside and say, not yet. Don't go in yet. Don't go in yet because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. And verse 3 says that all the sons of Israel Seeing the fire come down and the glory upon the house, they bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground. And they worshiped and they gave praise to the Lord, saying, truly he is good. Truly his loving kindness is everlasting. There's a time to shout. There's a time to leap. There's a time to jump. There's a time to run. And then there's a time of reverence and awe. And there's a time to put your face to the carpet. And there's a time to bow down. And there's a time with your face in the carpet, murmuring the glory of God, giving praise. He is good, and his loving kindness is everlasting. That's what I was kind of trying to facilitate today, <laughs> that sometimes you have to shift into a different gear. Sometimes the different gear repostures you to the point where it's adoration and it's glory and it's reverence and it's awe and it's waiting to see what God is going to do. So here's my question for you today. Do you want to see the glory of God? Now, most people, of course, you're a good, you're a good church goer. Yes, I want to see the glory. <laughs> of course, pastor, I want to see the glory. You want to see the glory of God? Here's what they had to do to see the glory of God. They had to pray. Solomon prayed. But look, they also gave sacrifices. According to Scripture, when you study the Scripture, Solomon, the richest man who ever lived, by the way, gave an offering. Back then, it was about the cattle. It was about the land and giving your first and your best of what you had. Your wealth was measured by cattle and by, by, by sheep and by territory and by land. And so, and so Solomon gave 22,000 oxen. 120,000 sheep he offered unto the Lord as a sacrifice. He gave of his substance, and he gave lavishly, and he gave extravagantly. And then they gave their worship as they put their face to the ground and praised the Lord. You want to see the glory of God this summer? One, we got to learn how to pray. To pray, to, to talk to God, to seek his face. And praying is not just talking, it's also listening, seeking the face of God through prayer. You want to see the glory? Learn how to become a prayer warrior, personally and collectively. You want to see the glory of God this summer? Number two, learn how to give lavishly and extravagantly. Before the glory showed up, 
They gave of substance. They gave things that matter. They gave a sacrifice that God himself could consume. In the Old Testament sacrificial model, you brought your unblemished animals. You brought your first and your best. And if God was pleased, he received it. If he wasn't pleased, he rejected not just the offering, but he rejected the person who gave the offering. It was offensive to God to bring a, a broke leg lamb. You know how when you go to the cookout and you're looking at the ribs, you say, that rib, not that one. No, 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 not that one. Not that one. No, I want that piece of chicken, the thigh, the dark meat. You know, that one. No, 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 not that one. Not that. No, no, no. It's like three over from where you are, from where your tongues are. No, no, that one. Yeah, 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 that one. You know how you get pacific about what you want. I'm going to be pacific. I just, don't give me that little small piece, that little wing. Come on. Then if you're small, you'd be like, don't let my frame fool you. I can eat. Don't give me no little plate. I can eat. I, I. You're choosy. And you're looking for the choice portion. And God is saying, why would you give me the broken wing of your substance? And, and, and most churches, we deal with this during the summer. Let me just say what happens. Attendance goes down. Giving goes down. We survive on a wing and a prayer. And then the, the fall, people just start coming back out of nowhere. I don't know where they come from. I don't know where they went. They just start showing up. It just, it just you know, right around time when school begins, people just start showing up. <laughs> it's like, where y'all been? The whole summer. <laughs> When you study the ant, you see that, that he's diligent during the summer in preparation for the next season. And some of us, what we're going to be praying for during this time of fasting and consecration, we got some economic situations. We got some financial stuff we need from God. And God is saying, okay, pray, give, worship. See, we, we're cool with the prayer and the worship because we think we can just offer that. That's intangible, and God is saying, wait, hold up. In order for my glory to be revealed, what if God needs something tangible from you? That, 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 that oftentimes what we're praying for is for provision, and God is trying to train us in understanding provision. Provision is understanding when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Don't hold on to all the other things. When you learn how to give God first, it, 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 it restores favor into your life, and you can trust God for provision. And, and, and Solomon said, we need to give a, a huge offering to the Lord, a huge sacrifice. They, they prayed, they gave lavishly, and they worshiped, and the glory of God fell. You want to see the glory of God? This summer, pray like you've never prayed. Give like you've never given. Worship like you've never worshipped. Pray like you've never play, prayed. Give like you've never give. Worship like you've never worshipped. Pray like you've never prayed. Give like you've never given before. Worship like you've never worshipped before. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's palace. And successfully completed all that he had planned on doing in the house of the Lord and in his palace. But now, verse 12 says, then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. And I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifices. Let me make a notation here. And I need you to understand this. God does not have to receive our prayer. God does not have to show up in our gatherings. Because the scripture is clear that God said, yep, I got your prayer request. I acknowledged it. I heard it. And then he says, yes, I have chosen this place. There are some places that God chooses, and then there are some places that God does not choose. Just based on this principle. It's a choice for God to show up in a place. It's a choice for God. To allow his presence manifest to come and, 
and I'm just so glad that we are in a place. And I think sometimes, New Vision, we take this for granted. We, we take the notion that we can come into a place, into a sanctuary, and we can feel and experience the presence of God. And I need you to know that it is special how God shows up. And, and it's not based on the lights, because you see the lights are bugging. It's not based on the LED wall, because sometimes it might act up as well. But when you're, you are a people that, and you love God, and you love people, and you're doing the work of the kingdom, and, and we try to keep our heart right before the Lord, and we posture and position ourselves, and we try to stand on the word of God, we make ourselves a candidate for God to choose us. God doesn't have to show up anywhere. God doesn't have to respond to your prayers. Parents, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You don't have to answer every question that your children ask you. Because you're the parent. That's part of your right as the greater. Yet as a parent, a true parent, you are always concerned about the needs of your children. And so God says to Solomon, I heard your prayers. You sent your application. It was received and not denied. He says to Solomon, and I have chosen this place. And yes, I'm going to, I'm going to mark it. I'm going to dwell here. But I also need you to understand some things. And I need the people to understand this. Look at verse 13. This is the Lord saying, if I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence, who is I? The Lord God Almighty is saying to Solomon, if I shut up the heavens and the rain doesn't fall, if the Lord commands the locusts to come, if the Lord sends pestilence, not amongst the unbelievers, but amongst my people, I want to challenge some of our theology. Sometimes there are difficult things that happen to us, and God is the one who initiated it. Sometimes we go into seasons of trouble and God not simply allows it. Sometimes God initiates it. And the scripture says that God chastises those whom he loves. And if you study the history of the people of Israel in the Old Testament, they had cycles, seasons. Where they would be with God, and God, I'm going to follow you, and we're going to agree to your commandments, and we're going to keep covenant with you. And then there were seasons where they looked at the nation surrounding them, and they began to adapt the other practices and procedures of surrounding nations. And they started to practice idolatry. And what would God do? God would shut up heaven and not send the rain. He would send locusts. He would send pestilence. He would allow another nation to conquer his people, not for Forever, but just to remind them of where their help came from. And sometimes God in his sovereign wisdom and divinity will allow circumstances and situations to come to the life of his children, not to destroy you, but to develop you and to bring you back to a place of fidelity to him. So Yahweh, knowing the patterns of Solomon and the people, he said, this is a glorious day. This is a beautiful edifice. This is a wonderful temple. I'm so glad that you built it for me. I heard your prayers. And yes, I'm going to mark it. Yes, I'm going to show up. But when you start tripping and I have to pull out the belt. And I know it's 2024 and some of you don't know what belt. I mean, you know, wear a belt and you got around your britches. Oh, we don't say britches anymore. Got around your jeans. And, 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 but some of us came from the old school where every once in a while our parents had to, they had to give some encouragement, some, some tangible encouragement. And, and, yes, they talked to us. And, and, and little Johnny, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. But after they said don't do it about three or four times, they had to help us out a little bit. They had to help us out a little bit. And, and a good parent, they don't abuse you. They help set boundaries, and they, they help discipline you. The scripture says that God chastises those whom he loves. And so a good parent will discipline their child out of love. And, and my mom used to say, I, I'd rather discipline you physically than to have the officer to discipline you by force. I, I'd rather use a little bit of force with love. 
and, and I'd rather you have this negative experience with me because I don't want you to get out into the world with someone that doesn't love you and, and, and receive a consequence that you can't recover from. It was the love of our parents, some of us, in their firmness, in their boundaries, in what seemed to be a box that we couldn't get out of. We didn't realize that that box was protecting us. And God was speaking to Solomon and the people of God. And he says, if I have to chastise you, if I have to allow some things to come into your community in order to get you to come back to me, just know that if I have to discipline you there's a way that you can be restored because every good parent even when you discipline you want your child to succeed you want them to learn the lesson you want them to come back and to be restored and so you give little opportunities for them to make it right and God is saying I will never discipline you without giving you an opportunity to make it right I'm even speaking right now to somebody you've already messed up. We had sanctified summer last Sunday and somewhere around Wednesday you slipped and you fell and God is saying I will always give you a way out but if you do fall into temptation I want to let you know that I've made a path, a restoration for you but in order for you to be restored you've got to come correct and you've got to come to the process. But if you don't want to come correct if you don't want to get it right, then you'll suffer the consequences of what you're going through. But, but, but the Lord spoke to Solomon. He said this, verse 14, and my people who are called by my name. Let's just park there for a second. Last week we talked about the fact that we are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, that we are a people that are attached to the name of the Lord. See, when I was growing up, I'm going back and getting flashbacks to growing up, there were certain things that you did as an upshaw and certain things you did not do as an upshaw. And, and, and I had to understand, and I came to a place, even at a young age, where I understood that what I did impacted the name of my father and my mother. Because that's Joyce's and them kid. That's Principal Upshaw's son. That's Pastor Upshaw's son. And so even, even as I was growing up, I understood that there was a certain type of behavior that was attached to my name and certain things that were acceptable and certain things that were unacceptable because of the DNA that was flowing in me. And I need you to know that when you're a royal priesthood and a chosen generation, that there is some DNA flowing in your spiritual body that connects you to the Father. You can't do everything. You can't go everywhere. You can't act any type of way because you are a child of the king you are somebody in Christ Jesus you've been called out of darkness and to his marvelous light and once you've got that light that light is supposed to shine why are you putting a bushel over the light that's supposed to shine why are you hiding the light if you've been called by his name and if you're called by his name and by chance you fall by chance you stumble by chance, you lose your way. My people who are called by my name, here's how you get back. You got to humble themselves. You got to humble yourself. He says, if you are called by my name, you can humble yourself. He said to them, pray and seek my face. Watch this. Don't miss this. And turn from their wicked ways. Then I, says the Lord, will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. And now my eyes will be open. And now my ears will be attentive to the prayer offered in this place. In other words, in this moment of consecration in scripture, God is saying, if you do these things, then my eyes and my ears will be open towards you. I've consecrated you as a people and if you follow instructions, your eyes and ears will be open. But also the eyes and ears and open of God will be open. So this time of prayer and consecration, right? Our eyes and ears, we want them to be open. But we also want God's eyes and ears to be open. We want him to see us, to recognize us. You know, when you're in a classroom, the teacher has to recognize you. And sometimes the teacher sees you but doesn't recognize you. 
but God wants to see your hand, recognize it, and give you space to speak. So here it is. Here's our assignment for the next seven days. Next seven days. Here it is. Number one, we got to humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves. Pride goeth before the fall. During these next seven days, our ego needs to be reset. We need humility. We, we, we need to decrease in our ego. We need to understand that it is all about God's plan and not our own plan. We need to be reminded that whatever we're doing in ministry, from preaching to singing to standing as a doorkeeper to serving in children's church to working in finance to serving on the safety team or working in the media ministry or working on social, all of that stuff, it ain't about us. And the moment we start thinking that we're so great and we got it going on, be careful. God is saying reset your ego. Humility is what he's looking for. He can find somebody else. Just as quickly as he rolls you up, he can sit you down. He's going to get his glory one way or the other. He can get it through you. He can get it around you. He can raise somebody else and use them instead of you. So humility says, Lord, I acknowledge it's not about me. Somebody say humility. humility. Secondly, we're going to pray and seek his face. Pray. It's not just talking. It's also listening. To seek his face means that we have an appointment with him. And he sees us, and we are before him, and he talks to us, and we talk to him. But you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Some of us are over-talking our prayers. Sometimes you just got to sit and listen. Sometimes you don't have the words to say. And I don't care how deep and spiritual you think you are. There are sometimes you don't know what to say. You start repeating yourself over and over again. That's a great opportunity to just... Close your mouth. Open up the scriptures. Let the scriptures pray for you. Go to the book of Psalms. Rehearse what God said. And as you get into the word and you pray through the word, your ears will be open and God will begin to speak to you through his word. You got to pray and seek his face. And number three, you got to turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your wicked ways. That means that there's stuff that you might be doing that if you really want the favor of God to come into your life, you got to stop doing things that you're not supposed to do. And that is so countercultural because the world is saying, do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. What did Ronald Isaac say? It's your thing. Do what you want to do. <laughs> I can't tell you. Don't repeat the last part of that because that was not holy. <laughs> That was not holy. Let me just let you know. That was not holy what he was saying at the end of that verse. I need you to understand that God has something he wants us to do. And it's not about what we want to do. It's about what he wants us to do. Turn from wicked ways. There's some stuff if you're doing, if you're watching stuff, if you're, if you're, if you're stuck in pornography, if you're, if you're sleeping with someone that's not your spouse. Because that happens too in the body of Christ. And God is not happy about it. If there's lust in your heart, if, 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 if there's malice in your heart, if there's somebody in the congregation that you hate, that you can't stand, and you have ill will towards, God is coming for that too. If there's someone in your family that you hate, that you can't stand, that you won't forgive, that you wish ill towards. God is coming for that. If you can't keep your mouth shut, turn from wickedness. Translate that gossip into true prayer. I'm not talking about prayer gossip. We just stop praying at people and start praying for people. Stop praying about people and start praying for people. Intercede for people. And we can't, we can't spiritualize mess. That's an offense to the Holy Spirit to spiritualize and try to make something spiritual and it's really carnality wrapped up in a spiritual package and spiritual language. That's misuse of the Holy Spirit. God is saying, turn from your wicked ways. Turn, repent, 
Repent also means to stop. It can't just say, I know I'm not supposed to do it. To repent is to turn and then to change your mind about what you were doing and to adjust your thinking so that you do what God wants you to do. So these seven days, you're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to pray and seek his face. You're going to have to turn from your wicked ways. And here's God's response. God will hear from heaven. According to the scripture, God will forgive our sin. And number three, God will heal our land. Somebody say God's response. response. God will hear from heaven. heaven. God will forgive our sins. And God will heal our land. If God says, I'll be willing to hear from heaven, that means that sometimes we're calling God and he's not picking up the phone. Sometimes the difficult thing about relationships and people who don't want to change, sometimes you have to not pick up the phone until they're willing to come correct. And maybe God is saying in this season, I'm not picking up the phone because I need you to humble yourself. I need you to seek my face. I need you to turn from wickedness. Once you've dealt with that wickedness, once you've repented, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin. And I will heal your land. And he's speaking to believers, those things that are connected to those who are called by his name. So the question is, do you want to see the glory of God this summer? Then maybe, just maybe. This fast and consecration is for you. I want you to sit in the awkwardness of silence because some of us have some decisions to make. And even now your flesh is wrestling. Your spirit is saying, he's talking right. But your flesh is saying, no, (laughs) I'm melting, no. (laughs) Some demons have been sitting on you like, ah. (laughs) In the natural, you're like this. (laughs) But the demons are like, ah. Because the bath water has been getting just right. I don't need you to shout and run out of here. I need you to walk out of here. I need you to walk with a resolute mind that God is coming down your road, coming down your street. But he's a good father that has plans for you. Your flesh is saying, it's going to be the worst summer ever. I'm not going to have any fun. <laughs> Tell me, what did that fun in, 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 in oh, somebody went back to 02, 12, 22, 23. What type of fruit did that fun produce in your life? And God is saying, let's have some different fun. Let's have some fun connected to purpose. Let's have some fun connected to identity so you can understand who you really are and who you ain't. So you can stop trying to be what you ain't. Some of us are trying to be things and God is saying, you've outgrown that. That ain't you. That ain't you. God wants to give you a new pattern, a new focus. It's a different anointing today. Because God has a different anointing for you. Different seasons require different things. And the awkwardness that you feel now is better than the awkwardness you feel after you mess up. It's better than the awkwardness of the conversations that you have to have when you've gone off. God is saying, give me the awkwardness now. Give me the surrender now. The grace is not simply what you apply after you've messed up. There is a grace to keep you from messing up. 
And God is dispensing that grace now. Father, you have spoken. The word has gone forth to your people. There's no more conversation from me to them. There's now conversation between you and them. Continue the conversation beyond this moment. I pray blessing and benediction. And I pray for the courage of your people to hear what you are saying to your church and to respond. We're ready to go deeper. We're ready for this fast and consecration. Transform us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen.